Good evening and welcome to tonight's conversation with Sherry Mendelson and Glenn Adamson. I'm Andrew Arnott with the Tibor Dinaj Gallery. This evening's program will last about one hour. Sherry and Glenn will visit for about 45 minutes with accompanying image presentation. There will be a 15 minute Q&A at the end hosted by Glenn. Please feel free to submit any questions in the Q&A tab as the conversation takes place. Um, there will be a few closing remarks at the conclusion of the Q&A. Sherry Mendelson is based in Brooklyn and upstate New York. Her current exhibition, Animals, Idols, and Us, is on view at the gallery through December 5th. Sherry creates her work out of ordinary plastic bottles, which she collects in and around her Brooklyn studio, using unique aspects of each brand's color, shape, and patterning. She recycles this all too common product into her amazing sculptural objects. This body of work draws on ancient history and her many visits to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Sherry's work has been shown nationally and internationally, including the recent solo exhibition at Glass Lake at Urban Glass in Brooklyn, curated by Elizabeth Esner, and Sherry Mendelssohn and foray and apparitions at the Hunterton Art Museum. She is currently in a group exhibition, in the group exhibition, Rematerialize at Arthur Ross Gallery, University of Pennsylvania, curated by Heather Gibson McTaderi. She has received four New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowships and is a 2017 Guggenheim recipient. Sherry received her MFA from SUNY New Paltz in 1986 and is a lecturer at Parsons School of Design in Manhattan. Glenn Adamson is a curator, writer, and historian who works in the intersection, at the intersection of craft, design, and contemporary art. He has previously been director of the Museum of Arts and Design, head of research at the V&A, and curator at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. Adamson's publications include Thinking Through Craft, The Craft Reader, Postmodernism, Style and Subversion, the intervention, the invention of craft, sorry, art and making, fewer better things, the hidden wisdom of objects. His new book, Craft and American History will be published by Bloomsbury in January, 2021. Thank you both for being here. Glenn, please feel free to take it from here. Thank you very much, Andy. And hello to you, Sherry. Hi. Hi, Glenn. Good to see Hi. you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in. I have to say this is quite an august and amazing event because in all of Tibor Dinaj's illustrious history, which of course goes far back into art history, I don't think they've ever had a Zoom talk before. <laughs> so I can, I can uh, verify this is the very first one. So uh, please accept any imperfections, but I don't think we're going to have too many with you two guys here. So. <laughs> this is the first chapter of a new era at Tibor Dinaj, and, and as I say, a glorious history it is, um, and a pleasure to be doing it with you, Sherry. Uh, first, can you just tell us where you are right now? I'm upstate, um, in upstate New York, in uh, um, zooming from my the small extra bedroom that I use as my studio mm -hmm. in the winter here. I just today was moving out of the garage. Um, the town is called Preston Hollow. It's a town that we're not in. It's about three hours northwest of the city. Cool. Okay. And I'm also in the Hudson River Valley, not in the town of Highland, although that's what it says on <laughs> near New Paltz. Uh, and that's a funny connection, actually, because you got your degree, I guess your first degree at New Paltz way back when. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I got my MFA, yeah, MFA. from the medals program at New Paltz, yeah just down the road. So, yeah. okay. Um, we have a lot of great images to look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and start showing them now. And the first question I have for you, Sherry, is kind of a simple one just about the title of the show. So it's called Animals, Idols, and Us. That's idols, I-D-O-L-S. Uh, so the idea of iconography obviously is important uh, as we can see from the uh, first image here. But can you just say a little bit about the title and what it, what it sort of suggests to you and why you picked it? Well, I guess I was looking at um, all the work that I was thinking that I was going to put in this show and, you know, the work that was lying, that was around in my studio, pieces that I was working on, pieces that were finished. And 
there seem to be, um, I guess, equal parts animal figures, pieces that were based on, um, I guess, religious votive figures, um, many of which were idols, and um, then uh, the human figure, um, both some that were, you know, modified self portraits. But I guess I felt like with all of the figures that um, that we were them or we are them in a way. Yeah, the, it's a great title uh, because it's very simple or simple sounding, but then it opens up into all of these associations. Um, just for one, I, when I first heard it, I thought, okay, the animals and idols are on the platforms and we're the ones in the gallery looking at them. But then you realize that the human form, as you say, is also within the repertoire. So it's mm -hmm. a kind of mirroring, but also mm -hmm. the interesting shift of uh, perspective. And of course you might say, well, does us include the animals? Does it include from the past? Sort of where does the first person plural start and stop? So I think it does all that. But the other thing um, which I wanted to ask you about is that word idols, because it's, a, you know, in the even in the Bible, I think the phrase, you know, false idols um, or thou shalt not worship, blah, blah, blah. It's, mm -hmm. it's necessarily considered to be a positive thing. And these days we might think of the word idol in relation to celebrities, to certain politicians for whom we have a distaste. So mm -hmm. I'm, I wonder um, what that particular word means to you. And also whether you think that the phrase false idol might have an interesting relationship to these objects that you're making. That's so interesting, Glenn. And I was so looking forward to doing this talk because I knew that you would come up mm -hmm. on with a really interesting take about everything. So um, false idols was not something that I had been thinking of. And, um, you know, as I've been looking at some of these pieces in both the Met Museum and other museums, I would look at these pieces that people worshiped and, um, and think about the, um, the, uh, the effect that art can have on one or the effect that looking at an object can have on one. And I feel like it, you know, it becomes, um, it's, it's like a spiritual experience, I think, sometimes going to the Metropolitan Museum and communing with these objects that, have, that were made so long ago. And, um, and I remember it was a couple of years ago um, as I was putting together the, the glass-like show with um, Elizabeth Esner and we were having a phone conversation about the work and I was saying, you know, it's, it's funny that people stopped um, or that I guess Western countries, you know, or stopped um, believing in idols um, or that that became a bad thing because what more is there to believe in really? <laughs> I feel like I can really believe in those objects in a way that I am having a hard time believing in, um, well, certainly in our, you know, political figures mm -hmm. um, yeah. and in many other things. So I, I have a lot of um, faith in those idols. That's interesting because um, that suggests that they're in a way true idols. But I guess one, one reason I was interested in taking that uh, direction in the conversation to begin with is because it's one of several areas to discover where your technique overlaps with the suggestive content of the mm. material. So we will get back to um, your studio practice and the kind of technical aspects of, of, uh, of the art in, in a little while. But I did want you to just say at the beginning anything you would want people to know about the objects in case they haven't experienced them materially before, if they haven't seen this exhibition because they're very, very specific, not only in terms of how they're made, but also maybe more importantly, how they seem to you. Um, and so maybe you could just, just sketch what it's like to be with them in a palpable and tactile and visual sense. Well, the you're talking about the pieces in the show, correct? correct? Yeah, so the pieces in the show, I guess the main thing that one should know about them is that they are made from recycled plastic um, so that is the, uh, the majority of the material. And um, so I, I make these pieces by, um, you know, we'll talk more about this later, but I make them by cutting up um, discarded plastic and um, then making it 
into new forms that are based on um, historical forms, um, mainly ancient art, but not always. And, um, and the pieces aren't uh, replicas or facsimiles of those pieces, but they often go off in their own direction. Um, so I guess that, that idea of a false idol is also interesting because when you're, I'm thinking of the idols, you know, the original pieces that I'm looking at, but I guess you could look at these as false idols and that they're um, referring to something, but they're just made out of our everyday trash. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, an interesting interplay in fact between uh, truth and fiction in the work because there's a very direct and I think extremely earnest relationship to that original object. And you're, yet yeah, you're also converting it into this valueless material, but then infusing that valueless material precisely with value through the incredible care that you take over it. Mm -hmm. This is really kind of a complex play of um, where the importance of the object lies. It's partly to do with referring to this absent original, but it also has to do with your hands and the feeling that you're bringing to the object. And I think you really feel the, the subtlety and elusiveness of that when you're with the things physically. Mm. Um, might be worth saying just a quick thing about glass. So you mentioned the show that you did at Urban Glass with Elizabeth Esner as the curator. And when I first got to know your work, I, I think I'm right in saying that you were more focused than you are necessarily in this show on ancient glass specifically as a reference point. Um, and one reason I bring it up is just that the surface qualities of your work, and we can see it really well here in this image, particularly the head uh, vessel on the left, and there's a kind of iridescence that you're capturing uh, from the plastic that might remind one of the quality of ancient glass after it survived for 2000 years archeologically. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that surface quality. Yeah, um, when I first started this, um doing this body of work using recycled plastic. Um, as I started putting them together, I saw that they began to look a lot like ancient glass. And um, I had studied metalsmithing. And um, so I did have some sort of a craft background, but I didn't really know anything about glass. And then as my work began to look more like glass, I began, or as the work looked like glass, and I began to look at glass. So then I started looking at a lot of um, ancient glass in museums and I really fell in love with it. And so I fell in love with, you know, the, the, the surface and the forms and just the idea that these things that are so incredibly fragile have lasted for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, then I was fortunate to have done a number of residencies where I worked with glass artists and learned a tremendous amount about how, how glass vessels are made. Um, and those experiences have um, informed the work that I've done since I had that experience. And that was around, you know, 2014 to 2018, um, uh, 18, I guess. Yeah, 20, or actually last year, 2019. So I've done some residencies during those years where I've um, worked with glass artists, um, but I'm always drawn you know, once I started paying attention, like in 2008 to ancient glass, I'm always drawn to it. And then the work in this show, I'm also looking at, um, you, know, uh, you know, terracotta pieces as well. So some of the interests have shifted, but, you know, I'm still interested in those, um, those glass forms and surfaces. Mm, okay. Now here we're getting to the um, first of a few images that we'll be looking at, which have to do with your source material. And um, I wonder if you could first say a little bit about this particular object, but then talk a little bit about what that aspect of your practice is about, the kind of, um, you know, the search and the falling in love and the curating of your own work, if I could put it that way. Mm -hmm. So can yeah. you talk about, uh, first tell us what this incredible, beautiful thing is, but then maybe say a little bit about how, what draws you to an object and how you go through that process. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to say what draws me to an object, but when I'm drawn to it, I'm like really all in. You know, once I find that thing, I'm just, you know, kind of, like with this, I was just head over heels in love with it. And it, um, it, uh, it really sticks with me. So this piece that we're looking at is a, an Egyptian fertility figure um, from the Middle Kingdom. And it's about 
five, about five inches tall. So it's really tiny. And that's interesting, I think, in itself that, you know, it might be like a really tiny thing. You know, when you're walking through the Egyptian wing at the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Museum, you know, there are those giant mm -hmm. forms, but, you know, then there can just be that one little thing that catches your eye and your heart, you know, and you're, um, and you're a goner. And with this, I think part of it was, you know, there's so many things about it. One, it's the form, it's the color, it's the surface, it's the drawing, you know, those black, um, like feather-like pattern that's on the form. Um, the fact that it's a fertility figure, which I only know because, you know, from reading about it, um, but it has, a, you know, the slumped shoulders. And then if you look carefully at the piece on the right, you can see the markings of a hand. And also the, the mystery of the piece, because I've done, you know, some, a lot of searching around and maybe someone knows, or maybe you know, Glenn, but I have no idea what those holes in the head are for. <laughs> so there's always that, um, there's always something in these pieces that, um, that, I, that I don't know. And so that kind of keeps me interested in, um, in the question of. I do have a theory about that for what it's worth. I think they're probably anchor points for a different material that was used to illustrate the hairstyle of the figure. Um, I think, I, yeah, I thought so. I figured that maybe it was it as well. Yeah, Lenore Tani, an artist that I worked on a lot um, for a recent project was very interested in Egyptian figures that had a similar hmm. approach to the, this, the kind of wig making. Mm -hmm. um, so it reminds me a little bit of that. But um, just to go back to the question of the relationship between your work and these ancient artifacts, I, I wanted to ask you kind of specifically about what it was like to be working when the Met was closed and the idea of the collection being away and only held in memory or indeed online as we now have access to it. <laughs> but um, whether that gave you a different vantage point on the play of presence and absence in the work. Yes, it, well, it certainly did. And I became much more, um, much, well, much more connected to the internet than I, than I like to be, mm. as I think we all did during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but I was making some figures where, you know, some, there's some figures, if you search, um, for them on the Metropolitan Museum site, that they, they have many different um, viewpoints, like the fertility figure that we were just looking at. But there's some where they only show one view. So then you have to use your imagination or continue to search around to find out what it might look like from another vantage point. But when I first started working with these ancient objects, I didn't have a smartphone and I didn't have a laptop. So I had a um, and I didn't even have, like up here in the country, I didn't even have, I think I had AOL dial up. So I was, um, I would pull an image up on my computer and then I would go into the, you know, in one room and then go into the studio in another room and try and remember what that thing looked like or do a drawing of something and then, you know, make something from it. And then, you know, with smartphones now, I'm so, we're so connected to the images. But then when going back to the Met, there's still that, um, you know, no matter how much you look at it online, when I was able to go back in, then suddenly, you know, like you, I, that, that visceral sense of scale and of material um, is so important to, to the pieces. Yeah. So I really missed that. And I felt a little... Um, Impression of that here in this image too, because here we get some sense of the kind of hands-onness of your process, I guess. Yeah, this is a bit of, I mean, what you were talking earlier about my relationship to glass. So with this image and the image before, I put them in just to, to show um, some of the experience of how the transformation happens. I mean, there's different, different cases for different pieces, but with this, um, that's a, a Cypriot figure on the left. And I did a residency at Pilchuk um, in 2019 during the summer. And um, while I was there, I, uh, I was thinking that I was gonna do a lot of glass casting. And I was thinking about these different figures like the fertility figure that we just saw. Um, so I made a plasticine model of it. And then I, we did a working with um, Morgan Gilbraith who I worked with a lot there. She was 
you know, my assistant, but she was one who taught me everything that, you know, <laughs> that I knew how to do there. So then we did this Pat de Vere, uh, figure with a, um, with a bear mask on. And then uh, both with this one and the, the previous image, then I actually had like a little figure as opposed to um, having drawings or images online, I actually had a thing. And then that thing became the model for me then working in, um, you know, in my recycled plastic. Right. So there are all, all kinds of different relationships that you might have to that original. And I think that's just another thing to highlight maybe as um, a way of talking about the contemporaneity of your work, because of course you're dealing with ancientness as the content and the kind of unreachable cultural dif distance that we might have with the original artifact. As you say, there's often a lot of mystery about even what they are or how they mm -hmm. might have been used. And they have these very um, kind of aesthetically moving qualities that are partly to do with the investment of time itself and the growth of Patna, but then also just to do with our, um, you know, lack of access to the original context. Um, so there's all that ancientness in the work. And yet it also seems like there is something of the kind of Google image search and the instantaneousness and the sort of quick adhesion to the object and the sense that, especially when you're in the show, you're getting all of these different reference points at once and it's a collection of these mm. contacts. Um, and I guess I feel like as analog as your work is, there is also something about it that bespeaks a brain that's been doused in the digital and all the kind of the rush of impressions that we get um, through our screens. I wonder if you would agree with that. It's a funny question to ask you over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, yeah, I think that, I guess that that is true because I do find that, um, well, first of all, I do love the act of looking. You know, I love going to the museum and just, you know, spending hours and hours really looking carefully at that thing. But then, you know, then that comes home with me and then I'm, you know, searching on my phone or on the laptop for, more images of that. And okay, that one's at the Met or you know, that one might be at the MFA Boston, but there must be more of them out there. So then I can like look at, you know, dozens of them usually, you know, usually not hundreds, but sometimes dozens. So then I can compare and contrast. And, you know, one of the interesting things or, or some of the interesting things are that there's like, if, if I find a figure that I like, there's often many of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a, it was a form that was made in, you know, in, in duplication. There was many iterations of, um, you know, like of a Tang Dynasty dancing figure and they all have the similar hairstyle. And so, I mean, I find that really interesting too and that idea of originality. And then I guess that relates in some ways back to the, the digital and that if we're all looking at, you know, similar images, you know, where does originality play in? Because we're all kind of bombarded with, with imagery. Yeah, you know, I was just, just struck by an, a thought, which is that taking your example of the Tang dan dancing figure, um, you know, those were really mass production objects or quasi mass production. And it's really in Chinese ceramics that you would start to get true scale, uh, economies mm -hmm. of scale that we would associate with modern mass production. But in a funny way, it's only now that we can digitally reassemble these artifact arrays that we can kind of get back to that scale because we are so used to it encountering them one at a time. And the internet has sort of re, it's, it's almost like it's, um, you know, brought us back into touch with the true nature of these objects as serially produced rather than as unique, precious objects. Obviously specialists knew this, but it's hard to get an impression of that until you undertake the kind of research that you're doing. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of, about it like that. Yeah. But that um, when I started doing this work, that was something that was really interesting to me was, um, especially thinking about glass, that that glass was mass produced, like when they did mold blowing of glass. So that was a, that's kind of what got me into doing glass was doing mold blowing by making molds of some of my pieces mm. and then turning them into glass. So here's a, a bit of a departure <laughs> for you, uh, Bill Trailer, the great um, self-taught artist. Um, can you say a little bit about how he came into your vocabulary or into your field of view? Well, I've 
loved Bill Trailer's work for as long as I can remember. And um, uh, we had gone down, I guess it was last, I think right after Christmas down to Washington and you know, just for a, a weekend of Smithsonian viewing. And, um, and uh, we went to, uh, there was a, the Bill Trailer show was at, at the Smithsonian. And um, as I, we, I bought the catalog, then I was looking at some other horses and riders. I had done some, made some horses that had riders on them. And so I was really drawn to, to this piece. Um, and then I just felt like the more that I looked at it in order to, to make it, I just felt such a, um, an empathy for this figure. And I, I began thinking of, um, uh, the fact that when you're really looking very carefully at something, you just, you learn so much just by looking. Mm -hmm. And um, the other horses and riders that I had been looking at weren't so specific as this one was. Um, so, uh, so I just felt like that process of making this piece based on this one, um, made me see the, the Bill Trailer piece in a new way. Um, I'm, I guess before I had sort of thought, you know, they're just such wonderful, um, you know, paintings and drawings that he does. But in this case, I saw the, the figure more like, I wonder, I began thinking that the, the writer must, was probably like, um, uh, like, I mean, to me, he began to look like the slave master or an authority figure and, um, you know, with a hat and his big stomach. So he just began, it just seemed much more menacing than I had originally thought of it. And I don't know if I would have thought of that if I didn't, you know, try and analyze every bit of that form, which is what happens when I'm making something. And, you know, I mean, obviously mine is not exactly like his, but I did have to think about, oh, like where the stomach, um, you know, juts out or how is he sitting and, you know, he's sitting upright and, uh, you know, he's in command, he's in control. Mm. It's interesting to think that the work is partly a pretext to look because it puts you in that position of really having to attend every one of its features, the original. I mean, mm. it does a little bit of that for the viewer as well, because having encountered your sculpture, it will give me a different relationship to a built trailer horse and rider. I mean, among other things, it hadn't really occurred to me that that motif in his work could be seen as an updating of the ancient equestrian format, which of course, mm. I'm sure, going all the way back, right? But but I hadn't really thought of his work in that context. I sort of, sort of thought of it as Americana, I suppose. You really are kind of creating a new context for his work simply through the act of paying so much attention to it. Mm. You know, up the connections. Um, here are the Tang uh, figures that you mentioned earlier, these Chinese ceramic objects, um, incredibly delicate and in quite a, an incredible sense of movement. Um, that was sort of another thing I wanted to ask you actually, Sherry, was the, that quality of animation and characterization that your work has. I mean, the, the general impression is one of great stillness and a kind of ghostly or ethereal um, quality. Mm by them but then when you look at them in detail and the one on the right is a good example of this you do get a very strong sense of the kind of um the gestural touch and the sense of line kind of draftsmanship of the work um and i i, I wanted to ask you about that you know the the way that you think of the drawing like quality of your objects yeah um I think a lot about that. I mean, I think with the the drawing like quality is um, is kind of what the what the piece needs. It's that external line. I always remember from an art history um, class when I was in undergraduate school, being told that um, Ang was all about the exterior line, and that really stuck with me. That even mm -hmm. though I'm making these pieces that are you know fully three dimensional, I'm always thinking of that exterior line and just trying to get that you know, just right. And that takes a lot of, you know, reworking and cutting it apart and putting it back together, but just making sure that there is, um, that drawing line is really important. And the reason that I got to looking, that I kind of came to 
really focusing on these um, on this figure was because the horse and rider next to it, um, someone sent me a picture of that after they saw the piece based on the built trailer. And they said, oh, this is interesting too, because this was a woman riding a horse. And that was very unusual. And it was a woman wearing Western dress riding a horse. And so that was unusual. But then if you look at like how she's sitting on the horse and her hat, she really looks you know, an awful lot like that Bill trailer. So I always like it when there are those really unexpected connections that are made across time and culture and. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a kind of universalism because you're being so specific also in the way that you respond to the objects, but it does suggest that there are some essential human propensities or traits that do recur here. Mm -hmm. And that I feel like that's part of the uh, you know, the detective search of the work is that it brings out some of that, um, that poignancy that's in so many different cultural artifacts. Um, here's another really good example of you thinking about line. Um, yeah. yeah. In the work. Um, the one on the left is actually a historic artifact, correct? Yes. Yeah. I always have to make that clear. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that again, and that's not a piece that I've seen in person. Someone sent me the, a picture of it. So you know, even that has a little bit of mystery to me because I haven't seen that thing. I assume it's very small, but I don't know because I don't know where it lives either. That's, that's interesting too, that scale gets lost so easily in our lives, right? Well, especially now in our digital world, in our Zoom world, like it's, everything's the same size, you know, that becomes very confusing. Do you generally make your works at the same scale as the original artifact when you know what it is? No, 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 no. I mean, usually not. Oftentimes the things that I'm looking at, especially when they were glass, <clears throat> are much smaller. Mm. And there's a few cases, and later on I can show one, but there's a, there's a few cases where they're bigger. But for the most part, my work is bigger than the original pieces that I'm looking at. Mm. Okay. Is that technically or, or for a technical reason, or is it because you want to achieve a certain monumentality or both? It's more to do with the materials that I have that I'm working with um, and making something that, that as I'm building it, it feels right in my hand. Um, so it's, it's not so much about wanting to make the piece more monumental, but it's more about the feeling of this, like the piece here on the right, like that this piece as an original piece, not based on the other one, but as its own form, that seems like the right size for that, that that piece should be as a contemporary sculpture. Yeah, yeah. It's something you hear from painters often that they, that's, the painting just has to be that size based on everything else that's going on. Yes. Yeah. An artist thing, it's something artists need to know about their, themselves and their work. Yeah. Um, oh, so, okay, so here we're starting to get into some process shots as well. So this would be perhaps the time to talk about the recycled plastic. And I know this is something you get asked to talk about a lot because it's very, um, it's very, uh, I guess, attention grabbing that this mm. aspect of your work at a time when the entire world is choked with plastic and we're all thinking of it as a kind of plague of material that we're living through. And so you've obviously found another use for this waste material that elevates it and makes it a kind of transcendental, um, as, you know, aestheticized thing rather than um, what it usually is, which is something in our way. Um, but I wonder, given the amount of time that you've worked with it, what other feelings beyond that simple narrative of reclamation you might have developed about it? Hmm. Well, I think that that, um, that reclamation of the material is still pretty important important to me. Um, and then it's just, you know, I think, you know, I, I sometimes just think, well, everything is made of something, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, I studied metal smithing, and then I explored a bunch of other materials, you know, plaster and wax, and like, so it could be made out of wire, like it could be made out of all these different materials, it could be made out of clay. So it could be made out of all these different materials. Mm -hmm. um, but what, so why not plastic? Like it just seems like as good a material as any other. And then there's so much of it and it's a problem. And so I'm reusing this thing that, you know, is just everywhere and it's free. And, and also it has all these interesting qualities 
on its own in that it's, um, you know, kind of refers to glass in that it's transparent or translucent. Um, you know, it's pretty strong. Um, so it has all these great qualities mm -hmm. that I think are often overlooked as it, you know, just gets tossed. Even the colors, I suppose, resemble those of glass, right? Clear glass. Mm -hmm. green, yeah. Glass. And oftentimes what's really, you know, kind of fun and, and fascinating is that the embossed patterns in, um, in our plastic kind of reference ancient glass. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. They're derived from it ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of inherent logic of vessel making is still with us, right? That's kind of fluting or, you know, the articulation of a rim. Um, this is a really fascinating image. Um, partly, I think this is one of the, um, what's well, sort of the icon object of the show, if there is one. It's been out there on the internet a lot. And um, it prompts a question for me about nature and culture because of course plastic is the ultimate artificial thing now, mm. artificial material. And I, I take it that this image is one that you took of a deer, is that right? Yeah, yeah. My friend, the deer. Yeah, a deer that I know, <laughs> know kind of, who's always been, ar who's been around for a while. Yeah, so I feel like I know this deer and I've been watching his antlers grow. But there's something about the, um, I, I wanna use the word animism here so the, the, the sense that there's a kind of zoomorphic life that you're infusing into the artworks that seems to find some kind of communion with the artificiality of the material. And I find that quite beautiful. It's not really a question, it's just an observation that particularly as you've signaled it in the title, you know, animals being a really important field of reference for you, um, that you're taking this inert, usually unloved material and bringing the spirit of a living thing into it. I find that quite powerful. Hmm. Nice. Um, well, I guess I feel like there's, uh, there's the spirit of the, the living thing, you know, of the animal. And then there's the way the animal has been depicted throughout history. So right. there's, there's that interesting relationship when, um, when I'm looking at a deer in the woods. And then I'm looking at all those historical um, sculptures and paintings and drawings and manuscripts that have a deer in the woods. You know, I feel like, oh, we've all had this experience in nature. Yeah, yeah. So that's a way of bringing nature and culture together maybe through the multiplicity and the sense of a shared experience across time. Yeah, yep, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, speaking of animism, <laughs> so here we have Anubis, the, um, what would you say, dog-headed god? Is that right? I think he's called a, yeah, I think it's a jackal is what they often refer to him as a, yeah. a the god of the underworld. And, and one of the other powerful works in the show, which we glimpsed earlier in the installation. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, which, you know, this work exhibits as well as the last one, is the jointing and the putting together of the object and the way that you're using that as a kind of surface painting um, because we're about to get into the technique that you're using and in addition to other features like the translucency that we see shown here to advantage there's also just this basic thing about how you're taking the different bits of plastic and putting them together and using that as a really important sculptural quality and I wonder if you would talk about that a little bit. Yeah so the pieces are so like I said, as I said before, you know, I, I find the convex and concave shape basically mm. and, and cut them apart and then piece them back together. In some cases, I sew them together with monofilament. And in some cases, I hot glue them together. And then um, I think that was a previous image where we saw the magic sculpt. I'm not sure if we've seen that already, um, but that, that's the material, yeah, that I often uh, will use to go over those seams. So the, the basic process of building is, yeah, piecing those parts together. And then in some ways that also relates to the scale of the pieces. Um, you were, you know, as we were talking about like the, the size of them and because they're made from bottles that are about that size, you know, the, the bottles are usually about the size of the piece. So I, you know, put them together based on that. I can put many pieces together and then make a bigger piece. Um, but, you know, that's just an, involves a different process. So they're all just, you know, these different processes, but they're basically 
um, you know, cutting these pieces apart and putting them back together. And then the seams, I think, you know, become like a drawing line if I um, go over them with the magic sculpt, which is this, you know, two part resin here that you see. Um, so if I go over the seams with that, that becomes like a white drawing line. And so it's not just the edge line, but it can be within the piece where they, um, you know, to, to emphasize those seams, or then I also might obscure the seams. So, you know, there's some freedom in the, the building process. Um, yeah, but so sometimes I leave it, you know, sometimes I sew them together. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to me that the um, brand name of the, one of the main materials you use is magic sculpt. I know. <laughs> because, I mean, it's, it's strangely fitting because uh, for you, obviously, it's not particularly mysterious because you've done it. So you understand exactly how it is, but for everyone else, there's this kind of, you know, double, triple, quadruple take because you have no idea what it is that you're looking at. Mm. It's like materials that you do know, glass and plastic, and ceramic, but it's not exactly like any of them and you can't really reconstruct how it's done, um, which, you know, to me is one of the great features of uh, powerful craft objects that they, to some extent, uh, you know, evade your capability to comprehend them on a physical level. Um, so there's a kind of magic trick quality to the oh. objects, um, and also a deceptiveness, maybe, um, sort of sleight of hand. Uh, and I wonder how important that quality is to you, that, that's, that sense of a, a sort of um, masquerade in the objects, material masquerade. You know, I, that's not really that important to me. And to me, it seems so, um, it seems pretty transparent. And that's why I put this image and the other studio shot in, because people always seem to say like, well, but after I tell them, but like, but how do you put them together? So <laughs> I thought like, well, that's how I put them together. You know, I cut them up, you see my shears there, and then I hot glue them together. There's my hot glue gun. And then I use the magic sculpt and that's basically, yeah. That's it. You know, it's pretty transparent. It's not, it's, there's not really any magic involved. It's just, if you look closely at your trash, you'll see that like that's how they get made. I'm sure Ava Hesse felt the same way about her work, but nobody ever understands that that was put together either. So. <laughs> yeah, I feel that way too. It's the difference between um, an artist's relationship to their work and the viewer's relationship. And that there's something about that distance, that sense of, um, being simultaneously let into the work's creation, especially a very process-oriented mm. work like this or what Hesse did that invites that curiosity, I think. And it, it, you sort of never run out of it, that energy of curiosity that you bring to the work. Um, so here are a couple of other studio shots. I'm gonna accelerate just a little bit so we have time for questions, Sherry. Um, and look at this other key motif that you've been using, which is this mounted um, well, here we'd see them as ibexes, but these kind of horned beasts that are raised up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here we see them again, this motif again in historical artifacts, and here in these really uh, sensational sculptures. These are among my favorites in the show, I have to say. Um, oh, okay. There's a funny thing that you've done with, there with the wheels that are one of the few tells in the show of the source material of the bottle. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that one on the left is not in this show, that was in a different show. Um, but the one, the one on the right is not, the green one is not in the show, right? in the current the, show, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but the other one is. Yeah, yeah. So can you, can you just say a little bit about um, this motif and what appeals to you about it? So, I mean, it feels to me so, I don't know, uh, ambitious as a motif. And so there, there's a real sense of grandeur in these objects. Um, and maybe a kind of ceremonial quality, I want to say. And I, I guess I wonder what it's like for you to work with this motif, given that stature. Um, well, it's interesting is that you say that because, you know, I had made those horses and then I thought um, there's a farm down the, down the road for me up here in the country where they have a lot of goats and I'm always looking at those goats doing, you know, mm. you know goats are very animated. Um, and I began, so an Ibex is a mountain goat. 
And then I just began looking at those curves and I was wanting to get more of this, um, the horse is kind of like a cylindrical kind of body as is the deer. And so I wanted more just to get that kind of like slope of the back and then the slope of the stomach. So that's kind of what drew me into this form. Um, and uh, I guess it also, I was interested in its ceremonial qualities. I made these during the pandemic. So I was sort of like looking at a lot of um, things that were tomb objects and pieces that were like meant to, um, to comfort the dead or that were used in funerary ceremonies. Um, and then the idea of putting them on a stand kind of had a, a, a grandeur, as you said, that I, that I was interested in of, um, of making them more than just the animal on its own, but um, um, locating it in a, in a um, I guess more of a, um, a cultural space or a, uh, a moderated space. Yeah. Yeah, there's, it's almost like this telescopic memorialization that happens in the show where it feels ceremonial for now, obviously 2020 being a moment that requires a lot of memorialization, a lot of sadness um, mm. and loneliness and loss, but then also this sense of memorializing all these dead cultures or cultures that have vanished from the earth. So there's a sense of a lot of absence, but then this resonant uh, sense of like, um, yeah, just pure presence in the, the works as well. We see it also in this um, this work, I think very explicitly, this sense of marking, marking mm. space, marking a time, obviously the ziggurat being a kind of tomb um, type of architecture as well. Um, and then this, these related pieces here. Um, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I asked you about the closed museum earlier, but do you have any thoughts about how this work looks differently in 2020 than it did previously? Is it, does it feel different to you in its emotional tenor? Um, I think what I, I don't know if it feels different to me, but I've been hearing from a lot of people that have been seeing the show that it, they feel a, a connection, that yeah. they feel a connection to the past. And that, um, you know, I just was having a texting a friend before and she was saying that she really felt like the work um, provided comfort to people mm -hmm. and a connection. And I was thinking, and I was saying, yeah, like I hopefully it'll have, it'll provide a connection to the past, which helps to locate us in the present, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, you know, connection to one another. Yeah, yeah. The broad view obviously is very important at this moment in time, right? And you often yeah, hear, we need that, right? Yeah, and you know, even the comparisons that are now incessantly being made to 1918 and the flu pandemic, or to the Black Death, you know, and other cultures that have gone through things like this, we measure ourselves against them. Um, and I, I feel like that's quite a, in a funny way, quite a healthy response, you know, to think of ourselves as not being uniquely cursed. Um, right having our own particular version of the problems, but also to understand that we're going through something that's fundamentally human. Right, right. Or, um, so yeah, the, it, it does feel, it does feel ceremonial, doesn't it? You know, both in the miniature and in, in, as a whole, the exhibition. Um, I think also when I was thinking about, you know, civilizations and you're thinking, you know, we're looking at, um, at these past, or I'm looking at these past civilizations and these are the things they've left behind and, you know, before um, the election, I think there was a little bit of a, you know, there was some thought of like, is this really going to be the end of, of our civilization or of our democracy? You know, like, where are we along that line of being, uh, um, you know, a, a live cultural um, civilization and when is that going to end? Mm -hmm. So this is a good moment for Kyra Walker to... <laughs> <laughs> Our great commentator on the American democracy. Uh, so th this is really, obviously this is about sphinxes and the, the motif of the sphinx. Um, but here we're also <laughs> confronted with very different scale of artworks um, than, than what you're making. And I guess I, I was curious to know what your thoughts were about Kara Walker's intervention into that lineage of form and your own 
and whether you think of them as related in any way? Um, well, when I had put these these together, I had been making a, the the previous image of the Sphinx that I had made, and then there's one coming, yeah, that one, and then there's one coming up that's in the show that um, in the show at Tibor Dinaj. Um, yeah, so that one's in the show. And when I was, as I was making these figures, I was um, researching Sphinx, and um, that one is in the um, at the Penn Museum um, next to the Kara Walker piece. But that whenever I look at a Sphinx now, I can't help but think of that Kara Walker piece that was at the Domino Sugar Factory. And um, in Brooklyn, I lived just up the street from the Domino Sugar Factory, and I've lived there since the mid '80s. So just, you know, speaking of the change of civilizations, you know, I've lived through that being a thriving factory and Williamsburg being, you know, a middle-class neighborhood where people lived and um, worked in the sugar factory and could just walk down the hill, you know, to the factory and work. Um, and then it was closed up and I'd never been inside. And then um, it wasn't until Kara Walker's piece that, you know, a lot of us in the neighborhood were able to actually go into the sugar factory and see what that looked like. And I mean, it was a phenomenal piece and her commentary on, you know, on working, on slavery, on so such a broad, huge, audacious piece, I thought. Um, so even though my Sphinx are, you know, very small <laughs> and like more like a personal Sphinx, um, I, I can't think, look at a Sphinx in a museum without thinking of Kara Walker. I love the idea of a personal Sphinx. Um, well, that image before, that's even how they described that one. Um, it was a, a oops, uh, that one, the one on the right, it's nine, as you can see, nine by four and three quarters. Um, and that was at the, in a Nubian exhibit at the MFA Boston. And that was referred to as a, um, a personal Sphinx. Right as opposed to the big one. Um, we're just about out of time, so I wanna take some questions. So I'll just sort of rifle through these last few images so people can see them. Um, there's your study, <laughs> self-portrait. <laughs> um, That's the us part. <laughs> and um, I think now if it's okay, I'll, I'll go to questions. Is that okay, Sherry? Sure, of course. Um, so we have a few, uh, first from Carol Soft. I'm just going to read the questions out if that's okay. Sure. Um, we are able to visit museums to experience objects that were made to celebrate the values and rituals of ancient cultures, but can you please comment on your own rituals that result in a body of sculptures that rescued detritus as it's elevated into art? It's a lovely question. Um, I'm not sure quite the question is my well, own. Personal rituals of the studio perhaps. Um, and whether they inform your work in any way, like are mm. there things you have to do to get yourself to work, that kind of thing. Oh, that kind of thing. Mm. Well, that's how um, I'm reading from the question, but you know, is there, do you have your own ceremonies that result in such ceremonial work might be a good way of framing it. Yeah. Um, well, just a little bit about the way that I work. I like to go in, I prefer the morning. I'm a much smarter in the morning and uh, I like to get an early start and um, I wish this wasn't the case, but I usually go in and turn on NPR and I need to have some kind of shattering of people talking in the background because I think that that um, helps to distract me from myself a little bit. And um, I'll often have books or my computer or drawings or something that gets me started on a piece. Oftentimes I have a few things going on at the same time. Mm. Um, gosh, I don't know. I don't really, other than, um, you know, that weird thing of like, I can't really work if I don't have like my favorite sweatshirt and NPR on, like <laughs> that's kind of my only ritual. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> every artist has a version of that. Like if you lost a sweatshirt, you just have to retire. <laughs> you know? right. um, okay, this uh, next question sort of falls under the heading of we actually don't understand how you're doing this very well. <laughs> Suzanne Schutten asks, is Sherry smelting plastics into molds? Smelting plastics is in scare quotes and I take it she's you know, well aware that that might not be the right terminology. <laughs> um, 
and says, your details are amazing. How do you manipulate the material? And we talked about that a little bit, but I think it would be worth saying a little bit more about getting the fine details and what tools you're using, are you using heat, um, those kinds of questions. Because um, I've often heard people say that what you do is like lamp working glass. And I've never been really sure whether that's true, for example. It's not true, no. Okay. Well, I think because with lamp working glass, they're melting things basically, that's right? I mean, I guess occasionally I have a little bit of a stream of hot glue, but for the most part, I'm just looking for like a smaller and smaller detail on a piece of plastic. Like, um, I was looking around to see if there's anything here. Like, like even on like the, um, if you think about a plastic milk container that has a handle on it, and then it has a rim and on that rim, there's just like five little dots on the rim where you screw the thing together. Like those little dots might become the lips or they might become an eyeball. Mm. And then, so I would just cut that out and hot glue that on. Mm. And then for like an eye, maybe I'd slice like a little, um, those single serving liquor bottles. I might slice that into a few slices and then pinch it together at the edge and that might create an eye. Mm. So. It really is, I'm not lying. It really is what I'm saying. I just cut out that plastic and I hot glue it back together and then I use magic sculpts. <laughs> There's, it's not mysterious. It really is just that kind of physicality. But you know, maybe it's important to keep in mind that I started off as a jeweler. So I'm used to um, fine detail. Mm, okay. And um, you know, I have a, a jeweler saw for cutting thick pieces of plastic and a little pair of pliers. You know, I have a lot of small intricate pliers that I use. So mm -hmm. maybe that helps to take away some of the mystery. And we just got a question, which is just how long it takes you to create each of the works. Is that something you want to talk about? It just, it's hard to talk about just because it varies so much. Um, but I can say that I thought that the, the show T at Tibor Janaj was finished before the pandemic. And if you think about the pandemic as being about seven months, and I basically wasn't really doing anything other than working in my studio. And I made about seven pieces. Okay. So, I mean, you could kind of say one a month, but that's, you know, it's good rule of in lockdown. You know? <laughs> well, I think it's helpful to, I mean, sometimes that question gets kind of, you know, uh, disregarded by artists. So it's, uh, it's not important, but I do think it's it, particularly in your work where, where temporality is quite important. I think the fact that there is all those days of care put into the object is, is good for people to know and helps you understand why they're so resonant as they are. Yeah. But some of those pieces took the whole seven months, you right. know, like I worked on it, you know, throughout the whole time. Absolutely. Um, so you're really living with them for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've had lots of questions, which is great. We're going to have to go quickly, though. Okay. Quick answer, Sherry. Um, Sherry, you mentioned this is Laurie Fredette. Sherry, you mentioned that you sometimes receive images from people and have created sculptures as a result. Has there been an instance when you've been able to see your source material after the creation of the sculpture? And if so, what did your careful after the fact looking bring to you? That's a cool question. Oh, oh, you mean if I didn't see it? Yes, yeah. Well, like I saw that um, Eleanor Ray, who maybe some people know or maybe is here as a painter, and she had sent me that picture of the um, Tang Dynasty horse and rider. And um, I guess I didn't make the piece, but uh, maybe I had started making something or I was making something that looked like that. And then I went and saw the actual piece. I mean, so I guess I feel like there's often a conversation. Okay. It's a conversation that goes back and forth. Like, you know, I'll be making something then I'm influenced by it. And then that influences what I make. And so. So it's not as simple as see it and then make it or make it then see it. No, it's always, it's always like a, a dialogue really. Yeah. Okay, a couple of points about museums from Ann Toba and Marjorie Simon. Um, Ann says, this is more of a comment, I often get object fatigue in museums while trying to look and learn at the same time. Your work releases me from that grip and I can look at them with a clearer head and focus on their strangeness. Um, she goes on from there. So it's a really nice comment. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. But uh, Marjorie Simon has a really important question, I think. She says, your love of the Met seems to rescue the Western Museum from current criticisms about colonialism. You take the best of what these quote exotic collections, or we might say exoticizing collections perhaps, give us 
and universalize them through your interpretation and your chosen materials. And I guess that does raise the question that you must have been asked before about appropriation and the way that you're taking other cultures work, either ancient or not so ancient into your own. Um, and the whole conversation around museums having appropriated other cultures, which of course resulted in a lot of these artifacts being there for you to study. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you're settling all that in your mind these days. Yeah, well, it certainly is a, um, a conversation and a problem and um, you know, and also, you know, teaching sometimes when I would send students up to the Met, they would say like, I don't even want to go there because that's just uh, an institution of colonialism. But I do firmly believe that if we don't really understand one another, how are we going to, um, how are we going to all come together if we don't really look carefully and learn about other, other cultures? Mm -hmm. um, Although I do understand that, you know, some of the, um, the acquisitions in the museum are, were brought together through in problematic ways and um, that the whole museum institution has a lot of issues. And um, I don't really feel like my work is, is really addressing those issues. I understand that the problems are there and I understand that museums have a lot of work to do. Um, <clears throat> and I understand the problems of, um, of cultural appropriation, but I also do think that we need to to look carefully and learn from from one another. And yeah. I think when you go back to a lot of the ancient cultures, you know, like where do you define like who's who? Like when you go back far enough, aren't we all sort of from a similar place? If you go back far enough, um, but I do under you know I do understand that it's a a real problem and a question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I might just say from my own position as a viewer, I guess for me, the fundamental thing about appropriation is that it has to do with an asymmetrical power relation that's also marked by a lack of respect. And I think that the, almost the core value of your work is respect. I mean, it seems to me that that's what it's all about in a way is taking this detritus that is usually disregarded and really paying some attention to it and realizing that it's a materiality of our time. And then taking these things that are respected, although often probably overlooked and walked past quickly by school children, <laughs> and really slowing down and saying, okay, what was the, what is the, what is this thing? And, um, you know, it deserves study, it deserves time, it deserves, uh, you know, a kind of love that you are devoting to it through the creation of the object. So, so I, I realize it's not necessarily a political intervention in the cultural politics around museology, but in a way, I think you're almost going deeper than that into something about why it is that it would, would be worth having that fight in the first place, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm surprised the pro that it hasn't come up more, but I think that hopefully it's because um, the respect that I have yeah. for yeah. the original objects is, is understood, hopefully. Yeah. Well, uh, I was going to say, uh, Glenn and Sherry, I think this might be a good time to, uh, to uh, bring it to a close, but I wanted to thank both of you so much for this uh, wonderful conversation. Our first one at Tibor Dinaj, and uh, we, you've set a high mark, so thank you both very much. <laughs> um, for those who haven't seen Sherry's show, it's on until December 5th. Um, the gallery is going to be open this Friday and Saturday for those who wish to come this weekend. And, um, and for those who don't know, many of the galleries, including ourselves, uh, um, have switched our uh, hours and uh, days and hours to uh, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, 10 to 6. And so, um, uh, Sherry, the, the, the last date uh, for the show is December 5th. Uh, if you wish to make an appointment, please feel free to go to our website. And you're also welcome to give a call at 212-262-5050. And uh, um, again, Glenn and Sherry, thank you very, very much. It was wonderful. Um, I can't thank you enough. And um, I wish to thank all the participants for joining us as well. And I look forward to future um, Zoom conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wish everyone a good evening and a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much to both of you. Thanks.